optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now it is even a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. I reached out to these Finnish entrepreneurs after a very talented acrobat introduced me to one of their products, which blew my mind in the best way possible. It is mushroom coffee. What on earth is this? Well, it includes chaga mushroom, very powerful antioxidant, considered a superfood. I was introduced to chaga by Laird Hamilton, the king of big wave surfing of all things. And it includes another mushroom that is considered a nootropic, a smart drug, and this is lion's mane. In the entire packet, you just add it to hot water, it tastes like coffee. There is only 40 milligrams of caffeine, so less than half what you would find in a cup of coffee. So you, I do not get any jitters, I do not get any acid reflux or any type of stomach burn. And it put me on fire for an entire day, and I only had half of the packet. So this stuff is really amazing. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement. Right now, this is the answer. So it is legal. It will not give you visuals. That's something else. And you can try it right now by going to foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. That is foursigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C, foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim, and use the code Tim to get 20% off your first order. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley, have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, etc. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim, take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they'd put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's used using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15000 which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally, when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me, uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account, but just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast, it's free. There's no downside that I can think of. Hello, boys and girls, wombats and squirrels. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to deconstruct world-class performers, tease out the habits, routines, favorite books, etc., that you can use in your own life. And I'm speaking in hushed tones because I'm in the airport, and I don't like to yell and scream like a lunatic when in the airport, lest I get a boot on my head. So, 
the guest, Mike Burbiglia. I've wanted to interview Mike for years. You can find him on Twitter at Burbigs, B-I-R-B-I-G-S. He is one of the best known and busiest working comedians in the world, both behind and in front of the camera. His stand-up blends a lot of elements, different elements, theater, film, storytelling, and comedy. This is of interest to me because he's been very deliberate in studying different crafts and tying them together. And this is reflected in his string of successes, which include sold out tours as a solar theater act. He just did 100 cities not too long ago. New York Times bestselling books, off-Broadway shows, feature film, TV, and much more. In the last few years, his work has started to appear on This American Life, which is an incredible show and a podcast for those interested, where he began a meaningful collaboration with the host and producer Ira Glass, who I'd love to have on the podcast at some point. Currently, Mike is the creator, writer, and star of the new film, Don't Think Twice, which is hilarious, heart-rending, just a wonderful watch. I saw an early preview copy and it blew me away. So I highly recommend it. I don't say that lightly. It's a great movie. If you've struggled with notions of feeling like a failure, hoping for success, achieving some degree of success, and then getting more or less than you bargained for. It's it's an incredible journey. So I do recommend you check that out. And how the hell does he pull all of this stuff off? He seems to be juggling a million projects. I aim to find out. We dig into it. So without further ado, please enjoy Mike Berbiglia. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. It's a uh, very exciting and and timely for me to be here, <laughs> and uh, uh, because I, I'm because I'm 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 digging into all of your stuff. I'm immersing myself, and it is affecting my life in real time. So speaking with you is almost a virtual reality experience. Well, I think this is a mutual feeling since I've been a a consumer and fan of your comedy for so long, and I've started thinking after Elon Musk hints that we could be logically speaking players in some sophisticated future entities video game uh that um this might all be a virtual reality uh, i'll be a very <laughs> yes. s- sophisticated one but if if i wanted to bring us back to the earth at least as we understand it for a second i pinged a number of mutual friends of ours uh brian koppelman of course famed screenwriter all around good guy uh chris saka uh, both of whom have been on the podcast before because they've spent some time with yes. you and I wanted to ask a number of things that they brought up. So the first was from Koppelman. And I asked very specifically, does he have any obsessions that you know of outside <laughs> of comedy? And one word back, pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. So can you elaborate on this, please? It's such an embarrassing uh, obsession because it's a simple... You know, it's 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 bread and cheese and sauce. I mean, it's a, hearing you say that makes me realize how simple of a human being I am. I have a joke from my first album, Two Drink Mike, which is I love pizza so much I would marry it, but it would just be an elaborate ploy to eat her whole family at the reception. But it's uh, it's so I mean, so stupid. But I yeah, I love pizza. I think it's just you know, it's the simplicity of it. It's from my childhood. It's it, it, there's no deeper meaning other than my, by the time my mom raised me, um, I, I, that's, that's Freudian saying that because I was raised by my mother and father, but my, my mother was around more often. Um, she really kind of gave up on parenting and ordered pizza a lot. You, you know, like she didn't want to cook that much. And so she'd just be like, let's just order pizza. So I just got very used to it. And, and now I figure, well, in my adulthood, I might as well be a connoisseur and have good pizza. So what now qualifies for you as good pizza? If you could have one type of pizza delivered to you, and I'm sure there are many options, but uh, is are you a, a deep dish? Are you a New York no. style thin crust? What are we talking? Yeah, yeah. I think there's two kinds of pizza that I like most. One is New York, New York uh, thin crust, uh, coal oven, and um, places like Arturo's and Lucali. Uh, Luzzo. And then I have this odd, you know, from my childhood, just in Massachusetts, there's a ton of Greek pizza. Just there's all these sort of greasy Greek pizzerias that I grew up on. And, and so I have a fondness for that. Like, so if I'm driving, it's it's like all through New England. So if I'm driving to my parents' house and 
you know, I'll stop in Connecticut, like at the side, like a pizzeria on the side of the road in like a suburb of Connecticut and just get pizza. The the old well, and the other one, the other pit stop there is New Haven has extraordinary pizza too. Really? Never would have guessed yeah. in a million years. And now is there something that characterizes Greek pizza other than the fact that it's made by Greeks? Is it the same ingredients or do they do anything particularly? No, no, it, it's same ingredients. It's just, it, it's just sort of a, it, it's a medium sized crust pizza. Uh, but, but, but I mean, and there's a million theories on pizza. Uh, m- most people say it's based on, w- you know, the water. I mean, there's book, there's books and books written about pizza, but you know, that's people say it's, it's, it's water based. What makes it good, which is why for whatever reason, New York pizza is better, uh, in my opinion, than, than most places. And actually P- the reason compliment is also bringing that up, I think is that I would have these readings for my film. Don't think twice at my house to workshop the film script the way that I would work, I workshop my standup. And I would always, ha- I would have over people like Brian Koppelman, Michael Weber, y- y- you know, like uh, Phil Lord came to one of them, Nicole Hall Center. And I would always have the best pizza. Like I'd have Lucali or I'd have Lutzo. And I would say at the beginning of the reading, the script might be bad, but at the end, we're all going to eat pizza. And so, <laughs> it's, like, it's like dealing with the grade schoolers. <laughs> it is like dealing with grade schoolers, but it's a great incentive. I always urge people, I always urge like screenwriters or anyone who needs feedback on their work to just invite people to something where you give them something, to give them food, give them ice cream, give them pizza and, and try and solicit their feedback because feedback I think is the most valuable thing you can have for your writing. So let's let's talk about well two things since they came up the the movie first of all I I was very excited to get a a sneak peek I suppose early access on sure. Vimeo and uh, I'm only a half hour in but I've I've loved it I watched it actually with a uh, friend and also former podcast guest uh, Cal Fussman who wrote oh, the uh, What I Learned column or a large portion of it for decades for Esquire and we both after. Uh, watching the portion we watched because I had to jump on the phone to to do this interview. Uh, number one, he said, well, you should skip ahead to see the end so that you can <laughs> discuss it with Mike. And and I said, no, no, no. I want to actually, I want to watch the rest of the movie, the entire movie All tonight. Right. Yes. So I was very uh, pleased and relieved that the movie is really, really good. And it, it made me, I'm going to digress here because that's my style, but sure. many moons ago, I actually took one and it was the only improv class at a place called Bobino Casting in San Francisco. I remember it. It brought wow. back memories. And it made me want to go take improv classes as well as go see good improv. Yeah. Uh, but so that's, so the the Don't Think Twice, I, I would highly recommend people check out. And uh, Sokka loves it as well. And it gets better, by the way. And, and it I, gets better. I, I mean, I'm not even, I'm not even through nice kind of act one. Haven't. Yeah. I, I'm, it's nice that you haven't seen the whole thing because I can dance around things and so that the listeners don't, aren't spoiled on things and but but yeah it gets better but what one of the comments that came up from cal and i concurred was that the writing was really good so i want to talk about the workshopping what is the format like could you explain how you workshop the material and in in what at what stage do you workshop it i conceived this idea um my first film was called sleepwalk with me and it's um people want to see it it's on netflix it's easy to find and uh and after I made it, I I went back to improvising at UCB Theater after years of kind of taking time off from improv. I'd studied it in college, et cetera. And the reason I went back to it is because UCB ups uh, upright Upper Citizens Brigade Theater yes, right. in, in New York and in Los Angeles, actually. And the reason I went back to it is because I realized that so many of the principles, probably the similar, you know, the, the principles that uh, that you see at the beginning of the movie and that you probably studied in your class. Um, say yes, it's all about the group, don't think, you know, just do. And um, all those principles are really what got me through directing a film, which was the hardest thing by far I've ever done in my entire life. And I, after I directed it, I was like, how the hell did I even live through that? Like, how did I even stay alive? And I realized that it was all these things in improv that had taught me that. And so I veered back into doing improv. And one night my wife Who's, who's brilliant, came to one of my improv shows. And she made this observation, and I thought it was wonderful, which is she goes, it's, you know, I think it was on that, on that given night, it was like, it's, it, guest improvisers sit in with me 
this show called Mike Birbiglia's Dream. And any given week, it'll be like A.D. Bryant from SNL or Ellie Kemper from Kimmy Schmidt or like, you know, Zach Woods from the Silicon Valley. And, and she said, my wife said, it's amazing watching this art form with these people because it's all about the group and how everyone's equal. But in real life, that person's a TV star, that person's a movie star, and that person shares a one bedroom in Bushwick with five dudes who live on air mattresses. And I thought, man, that's not just a great observation. It's a whole movie. I mean, that is a whole movie to me. And I could just see the movie. And I started just writing out just this really kind of throw up what I call what I'd call a throw up pass of the of the movie script. I would go to coffee shops in the morning uh, for three. My minimum is three hours. I stick myself in a coffee shop with no Internet and uh, no email, no anything. And then if it's going well, I go up to five hours. And if it's not going well, I, I just end at three hours. But and then I would. So sorry, then, to, sorry to interrupt. What time sure. do you have? A, do you have a time that you've generally used for that? A. I try, do, to, do, I try you, to do. I try to do seven a.m. I try to do. I try to write before my inhibitions take hold of me. Ah, right. So I almost try. I always, I always say write because I'm an actor as well. I always say write in a trance and act in a trance. Like it's almost like you you don't even want to think consciously about what you're putting on the page for fear of, oh, you wrote this down in your book. You, e you write them as emails to people. Um, right. And, and I think that's such a brilliant, is that, that's in your book, right? Yeah, no, it is. And just for people who don't have that context, I, or I might have talked about it in an interview perhaps where I said that I, I basically threw out the first few drafts of four or five chapters of the four hour work week because it was either too pompous or too slapstick. And then I decided yes. to literally go into an email compose window and write the first chapter as if it were just a letter to a close friend after me having had two drinks. That was basically it. And the that, approach. That's, so, that's so brilliant. And a lot of times what I do is I'll write in my journal um, as though it'll never be seen by anyone ever. And then more often than not, the things I put in my secret journal are the things that, that I, 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 I publish. And when you sit down at the coffee shop 7 a.m. or just beforehand, couple of things. Do you have a particular type of coffee or beverage? And then do you use word? Do you use? Uh, I do. A I do a cappuccino and I do magic movie. Magic screenwriter is the program I use or I write in a notebook by hand. I try I, I try to write as much in by hand in, an, in a like a nice notebook that I'll you know, that has some meaning to me. Sometimes I'll have my friends like one, once I was on last summer, I was on tour for the movie Trainwreck and with Dave Attell and Amy Schumer and Vanessa Bayer. And it was my birthday. And Dave Attell got me a, a journal. Like, it was really sweet. He just, you know, he just, he just like gave me a little gift for my birthday. He bought an, we were in Seattle on tour. He gave me a nice journal. That's really and nice. I said, one, of my, one of my favorite stand-up comics. Never had any interaction with him. But really oh, yeah. awesome. Amazing. Yeah, one of, one of the greats. And, and I asked him if he would sign it. On the just on the back somewhere, and so he, I have like a Dave Attell notebook, and so it's sort <laughs> signature of signature series. I, well, I think of it as like it's ble I, it's blessed, you know. Oh, like definitely. sometimes when people ask me, like sometimes people ask me to sign their notebook, and I'll write like I bless these jokes, and then I'll write my name or whatever. <laughs> but like I, I with my friends, like um, it, you know Andrew Andrew Dost, who's a musician, um, who's in the band Fun. He came to see my off Broadway show, Thank God for Jokes, and he actually brought me a journal, like as a gift, and. And I asked him if he would sign it. And so he wrote this like nice note. And I think I, there's something about the personal element and the personal relationship with notebooks that I think can, can be helpful to the writing. A couple of really, I, I guess, perhaps mundane questions, but I'm curious nonetheless. Movie magic screenwriter, why do you use that instead of, say, a final cut or something like that? God, it's so stupid. I mean, I'm, I'm a real wonk with screenwriting. And uh, like I, I listened to the Script Notes podcast with Craig Mazin and John August. and those guys just, <laughs> they despise Final Cut. They just despise it. Um, and Or, I'm sorry, Final Draft. Oh, sorry, yeah, you know what? I always mix those up. That was, I just incepted you with the wrong information. Sorry, yes, yeah, Final Draft. Final Draft. But, um, and, but anyway, a few years ago, I stumbled across Movie Magic, and I like it. And there's no, there's no good reason necessarily. But So I write, and actually, this is a real quirk that I rarely admit to anyone, never mind in public. To get to finish the script, I found that I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I was analyzing my habits. And I was like, 
I'm putting that, I'm putting off writing a script, but I'm not putting off, you know, having lunch with Brian Koppelman or, you know, having lunch <laughs> with my brother or whatever. And so I, I thought, well, I'm always on time and I always show up to things. So why don't I do that for myself? And so what I did was I put a note, a handwritten note next to my bed that said, Mike, and it has three exclamation points. Mike, you have a meeting at Cafe Pedlar, that's where I was writing, uh, at 7 a.m. with your mind, which is so stupid. <laughs> uh, it's, so, it's so embarrassing to admit, but it worked. But if it, it works, it I, works. I was like, yeah, if it works, it works. I was like, well, I, ha I have a meeting. It doesn't matter that it's with myself, but it's a meeting and I have to be on time. I love that. I love it. The, the, the human mind is such an odd amalgamation <laughs> of sensical and nonsensical behaviors. I just love yeah. it. When you brain vomit. So I vomited those, the, 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 the script out in a few weeks. Is it scenes? Do you start with just stream of consciousness lines you want to include? And Yes, that, how, that's exactly right. And, and it, it goes from stream of consciousness. I'd like to see a scene of this. I'd like to see a scene of this. I'd like to hear this piece of dialogue. I wrote down like uh, I had a, uh, I, I corkboard my walls like it's it's silly when you see my office it's just like a wall of corkboard and one of the, the the three by fives I put up I put up all of these mind writing slogans which you can look up you know things like quotes from you know there's a Ezra Pound quote that I have in my wall that literally three words I think it's one of the best quotes for for writing only emotion endures and. I always try to keep that in mind when I'm writing because I think that that's, that's just a really crucial idea. Now, wait, you said mind writing quotes? Yeah, that's, that's um, mind writing quotes. It's, it's, the, there's, they're just these kind of like, you, you know, you can do Googles for like mind writing quotes and it's like quotes from writers collected over time uh, by famous writers and, and you can, um, you know, they're written up and, uh, you know, there's like, li like you look around and there's like lines from Hemingway and there's lines from George Orwell and Jack Kerouac. And, and, um, it was funny cause it was something that, um, Elna Baker, who's, who's a producer in this American life actually gave me as a tip when I was writing my book, sleepwalk with me and other painfully true stories. She said, she said, I had, when I wrote my book, she said, I, I had all these mind writing slogans on the wall and I, and I used it and it, it, it's real. I, I find it to be really, really helpful. So only uh, emotions endures. Was that the quote? Only emotion endures. Emotion. What does that mean to you? Well, what it means is, a lot of times, writer as a writer, you get hung up on, you get hung up on uh, cultural references. You know, a lot of times, like a, if you see a comedian, a lot of times, the the way that I lose interest in, in comedians, for example or sitcoms or, or movies or whatever is that it, it gets, it gets hung, like they get hung up on like a cultural reference, mm -hmm. a joke about a cultural reference that literally will be gone in, in four years or five years. Like what, you know, there's a reference to Twitter in my movie and, and don't think twice. And I was very cautious to think through the implications of in 10 years when tw Twitter no longer exists, uh, or is or becomes the MySpace of the future? Will that reference make sense to the viewer and uh, advance the story? And and because you know that I, I we always have to think in those terms. Like there's a part of Sleepwalk with Me, the movie, where my character is figuring out how to drive to uh, one of his gigs, and and he uses Google Maps, and it's like a very key visual. And I had to think like okay, what's going to be the mapping system of the future? And then like, will people be able to grasp what this mapping system is in relation to the story? In, in other words, like if you get too hung up on sort of making jokes or in your sort of cultural jokes about, you know, um, things that might go away, then sure. that whole five minutes of the movie is sort of dead in a Definitely. way. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's at risk ephemera, right? I mean, when you have that topical hook. Yeah, yeah, and so and so my, with this movie, it, it was really about like what is this about? It's about friends, and so when it's it's about a group of friends coping with what it's like to be in their thirties and confront the idea that they might not be successful the way they thought they were going to be successful in life, and what does that mean? What does that mean for their lives? What does it mean for their friendships? And so it was it was about like 
whenever it would veer into something that was like a cultural reference, I would be like, no, 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 let's pull it back to it's about friends. And, and so that's what I mean by mind writing slogans. And then I would have also on the wall like things that felt like principles for the movie. Like I would, I wrote, like when my wife made the observation about how everyone's equal on stage, but off stage, they're completely unequal. Um, I wrote on the wall this thing I made up, which is art is socialism, but life is capitalism. And that was like, like a guide, as a guiding <laughs> principle for the film, which is like, like that. how is that, how can that be a conflict between these friends? You should, you should add your own quote to the, the mind writing quotes collection. <laughs> well, you know, you know who bites me on that is uh, Bernie supporters. <laughs> they, go, they go, yeah, but it doesn't have to be. And I, yeah, I, I, I get their point. I get their point. <laughs> so the, now, at what point then do you invite your friends over and ply them with pizza? What, so, what, what, what form, like how rough is it when you give it to them? Probably about two months in, it was, yeah, I started writing uh, two years ago in end of April. And then like June, it was like June 10th, I had people over. And so it was like two months in draft and I had people over and I said, you know, I preface it. I say, it's, it, may, it might not be good. And thanks for coming. And those ended up, I had like 10 or 12 of those at my house. They ended up being some of the most fun part of the process um, entirely because it's, uh, it, you know, it, because there's, there's really no stakes to showing your friends your work. I mean, it feels like there's stakes. I was very nervous and, and, you know, but, but there, it's just, there's something communal about it. There's something fun about it. And do you do a table read? Do you have people take roles or do they just all read yeah, in so, silence and then give you feedback? How does it work? No, no, no. So I re I have them read it aloud and um, like I would have, my assistant at the time, Greg, would read the screen directions, and and a bunch. I would assign parts, and I would highlight the scripts for people, and then we'd read it aloud, and then we'd eat pizza, and we just kind of talk about uh, the, what what it made us feel like. You know, my my the the director of my one person shows is this guy named Seth Barra. She's a really brilliant theater director, and he um he always does this thing dramaturgically, which is ooh, good word. He will listen to, I will pitch him what I'm working on, what my idea is, or a piece of writing. I even did it this week because I was asked to write a, a piece for a storytelling event in Nantucket Film Festival. And I read it to him over the phone. And so he, and then he says back to me, well, what I get from that is this. And it's like this not a non-judgmental way of interfacing with a collaborator. So, so in other words, you know, I, I give him, he reads this script and then he says, you know, well, what I get from it is it's a group of friends and, you know, one of them ends up being more successful than the other. And then they're all trying to figure out what they're doing with their lives. And so if that's, if he says that back to me and I think to myself, well, no, it's more, it's more than that. It's actually about this, 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 and this. And he says, well, that's not what I got from it it's actually helpful to the process because it's, I think one of the most important things about writing is that, that you, that people are getting what you're intending. Like I listened to an interview with Ron Howard where he was talking about how he, he shows his movie to tons of test audiences and it's not so that they can tell him what the vision for the movie should be in the rough cut form but it's to find out whether his vision is landing with people. And if it's not landing and if they're not, he's not, then he's not conveying it correctly. And he goes back and re reworks it a lot. So that's how, that's how I like to think of the screenplay process. And what I like to do is I, I like to work outside. Like what I'm doing essentially in my living room in, you know, in my little shabby apartment in Brooklyn is basically what they're doing on like the hundred million dollar level in Hollywood with tons more money and fancier offices and, and to, that it's quote unquote development in Hollywood. They develop these screenplays for years and years and years. And it's all these executives giving notes, but I don't want executives to give notes to me. I want writers to give notes to me and I want yeah. actors to give notes. I want collaborators who actually do, do the things that I like and, and, and who I aspire to be like, I bring, I like invite people over who are way better writers than me. Like I, I have no business like getting notes from Phil Lord, you know, who's, 
the director of you know 21 Jump Street and you know the Lego movie like he's just like a brilliant brilliant mind but who cares i'm just going to ask him to come if he doesn't want to come that's fine too <laughs> <laughs> and 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 do you generally say go through a 5 minute scene in its entirety and then people do a postmortem and give their uh, their thoughts or will will, will they so read a line like, and then say you know what like that my character wouldn't say that that's weird it sounds stilted like how do you how do you actually uh, facilitate we read it start to finish so we read it as though it's a table like a table read for for a sitcom or, or a movie got it and th- and then at the end we just kind of adjourn and you know some fiery discussions start you know a lot of people give their thoughts and and they really conflict with other people's thoughts and those people fight with each other and i listen to that and it's it's really helpful so you don't swear on stage uh generally as i understand it although True. saka said one or two funny exceptions perhaps <laughs> and in the uh, recent and in the recent show think up for jokes i actually dissect why i don't curse gratuitously on stage and and why in some ways in the thank god for jokes show i departed from that a, a, a little bit which i can explain yeah please please explain because for instance i've been i i am an avid consumer of stand up love it and have have uh, I've heard, for instance, Dirty Jim Gaffigan, but he, <laughs> he, he is, he's largely sanitized, uh, mm-hmm. but he can often pull it off, right? And so what is your logic behind uh, your approach? My logic was, it started off in, in kind of an embarrassing way, which is to say that my parents were very upset that I was going to pursue comedy. Uh, they... I, uh, my mom, my, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a nurse. Those are professions where people help other people and are ashamed of their artistic children. And, and, uh, <laughs> so, but my mom was so upset when I was moving to New York and, and she said, just don't become one of those dirty comedians. And I said, okay. And she said, you don't have to use those words to be funny. For example, Oprah's very funny. And I was like, mom, I'm not sure you, you understand my goal. I'm not, trying, <laughs> I'm not trying to be the queen of daytime, but you know, it's stick, it's stuck with me because you know, you want to make your parents happy. You, you, you know, you, you want to pursue your goals, but you're also, you know, these people gave you everything. And so you have to heed, you should heed that to some extent. And so I've tried not to curse for a lot of years. Um, but I do, I do feel conflicted about that sometimes because a lot of comedians I admire most did curse on stage. Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, and then some of them who famously don't curse are secretly criminals. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'll reference, but uh, but yeah. And so and so I I'm somewhere in between that. I will say that I don't curse gratuitously more often as 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 word choice than it is to sanitize it for people who object for uh you know uh christian reasons about words like like i i have no problem i curse a lot quite a bit in my life but i but when you're a writer i think that word choice is important i think word variety is important so if you say i don't know if you curse on the podcast but if i you, do if, i do occasionally but i try not so to be if you, egregious if you say that if you say the f word you know 75 times in an hour that's poor word choice. Like you're it not is. being creative. It, it's lazy. Yeah. It's lazy. It's like it's... using the adjective interesting as a modifier for everything. Ah, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, there's this brilliant film that uh, calls out uh, that point at, at, at the festival. It's called Captain Fantastic. And it's coming out, I think, maybe in September. Is this Great with Viggo Mortensen? It is. It I've, is. I've yes. heard a, so, a friend of mine saw a screener and said it was fantastic. I haven't. Wonderful. But it's but it's a it's a father who raises his family in sort of the woods, like off the grid, so to speak, in Washington State, and he he won't let the kids say the word interesting because it doesn't mean anything. And I it's actually it's, it called it 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 made me reconsider that as a word choice and and try to banish it from my vocabulary. But but anyway, the point is is that the f word is not. I don't think the f word is is effective as a monologist unless you're using it to 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 the right effect to the good to the good effect for those who are interested in delving into the etymology and various uses of the word fuck which is in fact very flexible there is a book called english as a second fucking language 
that That's goes <laughs> that is a, a fantastic short read. I think it has a quote. I might be making this up from Stephen King. Don't sue me, Stephen. Uh, on the front or some huge name. Uh, who do you run jokes by? Um, I run them by primarily audiences. Is uh, I go out and I bomb with jokes and I, and I see what lives. I, I see, you know and and then um, also my brother Joe. My brother Joe took me to introduced me to comedy when I was a kid. He, I was, he was a senior in high school. I was in eighth or ninth grade and I was helping him write these satire issues of the newspaper. And then, so that was sort of my introduction to comedy. And then he took me to see Stephen Wright live. And, um, that changed my life. That was when I was in high school and, and it just changed the way I thought about everything. It was like an epiphany moment of like, Oh, I want to do that. That's what I can do. And I started writing in my notebook and I wrote all these kind of Stephen Wright rip off jokes. And then <laughs> <laughs> really, and they're 24 like, hour banking. Who has time for yeah, that? Oh, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I went to a, I went, I went to a, a drive in movie in a cab movie cost me $95. <laughs> <laughs> they're just great. I mean, they're just endlessly great. If people are interested in that type of joke, another great joke writer in that vein is Mitch Hedberg, who I'm oh, sure people are more familiar yeah. with. So um, good. But, uh, but anyway, so once I saw Stephen Wright, I was like, oh, this is over. I'm doing this. And then when I was in college, I entered a stand-up comedy contest, and, and I won. And so it got me the chance to perform at the DC Improv. And then I got a job sort of working the door at the DC Improv. And, uh, and, and, uh, but the point is, is that my brother Joe and, and I always would kick around jokes, like ever since, you know, I was like 19 years old. And, and now he, he's worked for me or he's, he's worked with me. We, we run our production company for the last 10 years together. I, I like poached him from being an ad copywriter because he, he had gone sort of the route that my parents had wanted me to go and I veered into comedy and then I sort of brought him along when I was able to financially do that. Pulled him to the dark side. I pulled him to the dark side and he's, uh, yeah, he's an extraordinary writer and, uh, and so I run everything by him. But, but the big, big thing is also like I run... You know, I run stuff by Ira Glass when we're working on something for This American Life. I run stuff by Seth Barish when we're working on something for one of my one-person shows. And then my wife quite a bit. And then audiences. I mean, audiences are the the big determiner of what is worth saying. A lot of times if you're in front of – and when I say audiences, I don't mean it doesn't have to be 2,000 people. I mean, you know, 10 people at the Comedy Cellar on, at 2 in the morning. I, I can understand whether a bit is going to work, you know. For five years. I love watching comedians work on material and I've seen a number of them with notepads who are friends of mine working on material and they apologize after the fact and I'm like, no, are you kidding me? Like this is what I want to see. I can always yeah. see the finished product on HBO or wherever it ends up coming out. This is the in process stuff that I want to see. Me too. I love it. And so so let me dig into some of the details and see if there's anything to discuss. So the process of eliciting feedback when you pass something by someone let's just say it's it's comedy and you're talking to ira glass or someone like that are there any particular questions that you ask and the reason i bring that up is that when i have my friends who are writers proofread my writing let's say for a book i ask them first to highlight anything that is confusing <laughs> That's good. like whether they or unclear like it, i, I yes. whether they love or hate something is secondary to clarity, right? And as long as it's clear, they can hate it, but I want them to understand what I'm saying. And then yes. it, it kind of goes on from there. Well, that's similar, that's similar to the Ron Howard idea of is what, is what I'm creating being conveyed the way that I meant for it to be conveyed. Right. And in, so in your case, you know, Ira is a, a brilliant man, but not yeah. a comedian as far as I can tell, although he has yeah. his moments no, of very being funny, funny, certainly. Yeah. Uh, with someone like Ira or anyone else, like how do you, is there a particular way that you elicit feedback to make it as helpful as possible? I usually, um, I usually do it. I I'll tell people bits and jokes over the phone. Um, partly because they can sort of <clears throat> peacefully, uh, <laughs> peacefully give feedback in a way that doesn't feel so judgmental where when you're face to face with somebody it can be hard to to say a joke to them and ha have them feel the pressure of oh I I should laugh or I should politely respond mm -hmm. on the phone it's pretty easy to just kind of like skim through stuff and 
I can hear, I can hear when people are interested by what I'm seeing. Said, you know, Quentin Tarantino often. I, I've I've read this. Quentin Tarantino will call people endlessly and pitch the movies that he's working on, and he says he doesn't even have to hear the laughter. He can he can hear in their silence what their interest level is. <laughs> That's, it's like the, uh, the silence whisperer. <laughs> exactly. I, but I, there's some truth to that. Like when you pitch people, if you pitch stuff to people all the time, after a while, you kind of get the sense of like, are they hooked or are they not? If they're not hooked, you're, you should consider another direction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Tarantino is a fascinating case. I'm hoping to have him on the podcast sometime in the next six to 12 months, which I think could happen. Uh, why do you think, and this is a very broad question, why did you make it, so to speak, in a business where very few people do? Uh, you, you've, you've reached a level of success across uh, several different art forms, but let's just look at comedy and the various iterations of that. What were the decisions you made or chance encounters or mentors or whatever it might be that contributed to you making it, at least that being the perception, certainly? When I was 19, I had a bladder tumor and I was, um, I, I, it was ended up being, they, they caught it early. It was a malignant tumor. And so for the next, every three months for the next like five years, I would have to go for a cystoscopy where they would look inside my bladder and see if the cancer had returned. And it didn't, I was very, very lucky. You know, I'm, you know, it's like almost 20 years later and I go for cystoscopy like every now, every like two years or so. But that at this exact same time that I had this kind of life threatening, uh, ailment happen, I started to do comedy and I, I entered a contest and I won and I, I got this job at the DC improv and I would watch every comedian who would come through the DC improv and I would watch, you know, and, and the variety actually was really helpful. It's like, I, I saw Larry, the cable guy before he was a stadium act. Like I saw, you know, Dave Chappelle before he was a Chappelle show and George Lopez and Margaret Cho and Kathleen Madigan, Brian Regan, Jake Johansson, Jim Gaffigan, all these people. And I watch all of them and I would try to just bug them with questions and so I was, I had this kind of education in watching a ton of comedy and going to open mics and trying comedy at the exact same time where I had this realization from cancer that, that life is short, like, and, and, and can end, you know, and it can end at any time. And it's like, and, and it's in some ways, the best thing that ever happened to me was, was that, um, perspective. Because I became an absolute workaholic um, trying to get good fast. Like I wanted to become a really great stand-up comedian really fast. Um, and, and so I feel like that, that's the thing that – there's this comedian, Tommy Jonigan, who, who started in the Midwest. And I remember he opened for me one time when, when he was in college. And now he's, you know, he's been on Letterman a lot of times and he's, he's got a great career. But when he opened for me, like when he was in college, he had like I had done stand up like once or twice. And he quoted this back to me years later. And he said, he goes, you gave me this piece of advice when I like the moment I started. Um, and it's it's what made me sort of help, help me create what I've created as a career, which is if you want to perform five minutes of good comedy, write what you think is three hours of great comedy <laughs> and, and, and because that's the ratio that it, it's going to be you're going to you're going to write about three hours of what you think is great and that about five minutes of that's worth worth showing an audience that's a that's a good quote and i remember uh reading at some point i don't recall who it was i want to say neil gaiman but that's just because i have a secret infatuation, not so secret infatuation <laughs> with Neil Gaiman. Uh, so this is something helpful that I want to attribute to him somehow, which was a writer talking about process and discussing the frustration of, say, writing nine or 10 pages and only having one or two paragraphs at the end be worthwhile and feeling, oh, yeah. and feeling like the first nine pages were a waste of time, but then right. emphasizing 
no, in fact, you needed those first nine pages so that you could produce the two paragraphs that are of use. Not only, yeah, not only that, I mean, that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Not only that, everything that you do in your life, I, I've realized over the years, is leading to where you are. So, so in other words, like the fact that when I was in college, I, I worked at the door of the DC Improv and brought food to people's tables. And then I was a waiter at the tombs when I was in college. And then I was a, you know, I was a, 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 a temp in New York City at a pharmaceutical company. All of that actually led to the life experience that would be able to put something on the page that feels real. Um, there's a, I went to a, a, a little talk at the Nantucket Film Fest this morning with Oliver Stone. And the thing that I wrote down in my notebook from it, my takeaway was he, when he was like 20 years old, he wrote, I think, a novel. And it got rejected like all over New York City, like every publisher for like two years. Like he tried to get published for like two years. And then he joined the army. And when he got out of the army, um, he, he, because of the GI Bill, was able to go to film school and then he made films. And what he talks about is that it was the army that taught him to become self-reliant in a way that allowed him to understand how to make films, which is a completely... He goes, the army is what took me out of my head and made me understand that it's not about being just cerebral. It's about being a combination of cerebral and self-reliant and being able to survive you know, in the forest or, or whatever it is. And, and that's sort of what went into this you know, epic film career that Oliver Stone has had. And, and I think that that's, that's worth considering in this discussion. So... Given that, which I agree with, and how old are you now, Mike, if you don't mind me asking? I'm, I just turned 38 this week. Well, happy birthday. So <laughs> if you were going to give advice or could give advice to your 20-year-old self, 25 or 30, so you can pick, if you could just, pl <laughs> you, you could place us in what you were doing, where you were, what advice would you give to yourself, if any? I would say, r write everything down because it's all very fleeting. Keep, I would say, keep a journal, which I have, but I, I, would, be, I would have been more meticulous. And then I would say, don't, don't bow to the gatekeepers at, at the head of, in my case, show business, but at the gate of, 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 any, of any business or any endeavor, don't bow to the gatekeepers because I think in essence, there are no gatekeepers. I think that, that you are the gatekeeper. I like that. It has a vaguely Ghostbusters ring to it also. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's bizarrely true uh -huh. now in history. When you totally. look at Completely where we agree. are in, in film and television and the internet, I mean, there's this, there's this amazing quote. I think it's at the end of... Um, Hearts of Darkness, which is the documentary about the making of Apocalypse Now, um, wh where I think it's in the end credits, or it's one of the final things Francis Ford Coppola, pretty sure in the 70s, said that the, the best movies in the future, because of the way that technology is moving, the best movies are going to be made by like a kid, I'm, I remember it just from memory, but like roughly like a kid in Ohio who picks up a camera. And and start shooting something like that's that's where technology technology is going to be democratized and, and is and has been now um, in, in a way that's unprecedented for for film certainly. Oh well, even and, and, I mean across the board. I mean you have kids who are programming and piecing together autonomous cars in their garages. I mean it's yeah. it's really unbelievable. Although as the technology or despite the technological changes much like the quote on your wall, emotions and doers, the yes. core components of good storytelling, I don't think are going to change all that much. No, no. And as a matter of fact, I would say the same thing for my sort of 20 year old self is like, is like, don't, don't, uh, don't waste your time on marketing. Just try to get better. Yes. Great advice.
I remember a, a blogger very early on, I think it was Robert Scoble actually said to me, uh, good content is the best SEO. So kind of the equivalent of writing online, which is everybody's trying to optimize for search engine results. And he's like, just put out good content. People will link to it. Yes. And, and that is how you get found. It's, 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 be, it's, it's not about, and also it's not about being good. It's about being great because what I find the, the older I get is like a lot of people are good. Definitely. And like a lot of people are smart and a lot of people are clever, but not a lot of people give you their soul when they perform. True. Yes. Very, very true. So when you, when you think of the word successful, who's the first person who comes to mind and why? I, I'm going to, I'll say a political and non-political answer because I, if people dislike this person, then I, it kind of goes one in, in ear out the other. Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, Barack Obama to me is uh is very inspiring he he came from uh nothing uh he came you know and he um didn't he became president he's the president of the united states he um doesn't have to, <laughs> this is i feel like lost on culture a lot of times he doesn't have to be like he he doesn't have to be the president he could be like an extremely wealthy anything. Like he could be on Wall Street, he could be a corporate lawyer, he could be anything that, he could be in Silicon Valley, he could do anything that would make one, a person billions of dollars. And he chose to be in work in service as a country. That being said, um, and, and I met him, I met him at the 75th anniversary of the USO last month, which was, really cool. Um, but then I met him two years ago when my wife was pregnant and, um, uh, and I, we asked him, we, our whole thing was when we, whenever we meet someone who we know doesn't care about meeting us, we always try, my wife and I always try and come up with like a trick question that throws them off. And like, they kind of have to answer or <laughs> have to think about it. Like I, I give this advice to people. It's like, if you ever see Jimmy Fallon on the street, don't be like, uh, I love the Tonight Show. Just be like, what do you think of Kiwi? You know what I mean? Like, and <laughs> he, he won't be able to not be like, oh, I love Kiwi. You know, like, just talk to people <laughs> about a thing they didn't think they were going to talk about. And then next thing you know, you're talking to Jimmy Fallon about Kiwi, and then you'll have that for your life. But so, so what I, so, so my thing, our thing with Obama was, Let's tell him, because my wife was four months pregnant, but we hadn't told anybody yet, is why don't we tell him that you're pregnant? And so when we get to the front, I go, Mr. President, this is my wife, Jen. She's newly pregnant, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> and, and, he, and he couldn't help. The, fuck, the president of the United States couldn't help to be like, well, am I the first to know? <laughs> and and my wife says yes. Yeah. She goes, do you have any parenting advice? And he goes, um, we'll get some sleep. And we were like, ha 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 ha, because he's the president, you know. Because uh, he, you know, it's like wasn't that funny comedically, but he's like your boss times a million. And then he goes, <laughs> but it got better because he goes, oh, no, actually, I got something. He goes, uh, when you bring him home, he goes, uh, he goes, when you bring him home, the poo, the president said poo, and the moment he said poo. I thought this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> like I could die right now and I'd be fine. He goes, when you bring them home, the poo doesn't smell. It doesn't smell like adult poo. Adult poo smells bad. And then he looked at me for affirmation. I was like, absolutely, <laughs> Mr. President. Adult poo does indeed smell terrible. Thank you for inviting me to the poo summit 2015. And so... Um, and he goes, and, and when you bring them home, he goes, babies crave structure. And they're eating and they're sleeping. And, uh, and, uh, and he goes, and if it doesn't, you know, if in the breastfeeding doesn't always work out right away, it can be a little bit wonky. Don't freak out. And if it doesn't work out with the sleeping right away, don't freak out. And, and he paused and he thought about it and he goes, that's actually some pretty good advice. <laughs> He complimented his own advice. But I'm telling you, the best thing to do is you got to give people questions they don't, well, you're doing it right now. You, you got to give people questions that they're not expecting. Um, and then, and then my, my non-political answer, if people hate Obama, I get it, whatever, you're Republican, I don't care. You know, like, it's, it, that's your issue. But 
um, would be Bob Dylan. Would be sort of the, the uh, I, I think uh, uh, Bob Dylan is the great artist of our time because unlike the Rolling Stones or you know the Beatles obviously broke up, but and some of them died, but um, the, but he he continues to grow and learn and produce and to change. And so I think that for that, it's like Time Out of Mind is a top five album, Bob Dylan album of all time. And he made it, you know, what, what in the 60s? You know, it's like, it's unbelievable. And he made, and he made Free Will and Bob Dylan when he's like 21 years old. I mean, it's unbelievable. That is uh, yeah, when you've been doing it for three or four decades, it's you're, you've definitely passed the once you're lucky, twice you're good stage. Yes. The next question I feel like has to be out of left field for this to function after that incredible Obama story. <laughs> so let me try a question that I've been dying to ask someone, but I I feel like you might be game for this. Uh, which I, what are your rules for good sex? Oh wow, that is fascinating. Um, the standard thing that uh, Captain Fantastic has this piece of advice in it, which I thought is is smart, where the father says to the son, "When you make love to a woman, uh, be gentle and uh, and I think he says be gentle and listen." And I think that's wise. I think that's good advice. Um, I think. Uh, th- I think you should have sex, uh, assuming that it, your it, your wife or girlfriend wants this, uh, the more than you think you should, <laughs> 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 because it's 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 kind of like pizza, like it's never a bad idea. <laughs> so maybe yeah, man. I mean, you could even you could even add that to the list of incentives for your friends when they're proofreading. I guess. I mean. And the script might not be good, but at the end, we're all going to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Oh, my God. If, that, if that's the qualification for the next reading series, that will get so many people in the door. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I had a, a joke on my first album, which is pizza is like sex. When it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it gets on your shirt. Uh, <laughs> that's stupid. It's honestly the dumbest joke, but I still enjoy saying it. <laughs> is there a book... Uh, that you've given or books as uh, frequently as gifts? I give people the DVD. I, I give a book sometimes, but I, I more often I give a DVD of um, Stop Making Sense. I'm not familiar um, with that. It is the David Byrne concert film with the talking heads uh, that Jonathan Demme directed, I think, in the early 80s. And it's just a really innovative, strange concert film um, that's very much worth watching and uh, and taking in in a creative sense because it's so unorthodox. I mean, it's called Stop Making Sense in it. And musically, it pays off, I think. And I think visually, it pays off because um, it's very abstract. So that's the one thing I give. The other thing is just I give this book called The... Pro- People ask me about my sleepwalking all the time because I have obviously a very serious sleep disorder where it almost killed me. And so I give this book called The Promise of Sleep, and it was written by Dr. William C. DeMent, who is the father of sleep medicine in in this uh, you know decade or, or even century, and, um, and makes a cameo in my movie Sleepwalk With Me as himself. But it's a wonderful book, and people often say to me, because of my sleep disorder, what should I do? I have insomnia, blah, blah, blah. I always say, well, get, first of all, get this book. And second of all, the basic takeaway for starters is, you know, an hour or two before bed, turn off your phone, turn off your computer, um, and uh, and 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 uh, I forget what the third one is, but the, but 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 uh, yeah, that, that, that's the biggest thing is like think of don't cr- think of sleep as something that you don't crash into but that you ease into like that you that you're parking the car as opposed to crashing the car <laughs> parking space. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's, I like that I like that analogy. Uh any other favorite movies or documentaries? I love um Terms of Endearment and Broadcast News are two James L. Brooks films that I can just watch over and over and over again. And um 
that and those those are really the the the, the you know when I made Don't Think Twice when I make Sleepwalk with Me and when I make hopefully the next eight or nine movies, I, I strive for to make movies like those where you're laughing and and you're crying because to me that's what. That's what all of it is for. It's to experience the range of emotions within an hour and a half or two hours. If you, so on, on that point, if you could combine three comedians, alive or dead, into <laughs> one super comedian, yeah. <laughs> who, 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 who would you pick? Okay, so it would go something like this. It would go Mitch Hedberg. I'm writing this down on a pad. Mitch Hedberg, Doug Stanhope, Maria Bamford. So... Mitch Hedberg, I think, is the greatest joke writer of our time. I think Doug Stanhope is the most honest comedian of our time. And I think Maria Bamford is the most um, vocally and physically versatile. Unbelievable. Comedian. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, mean I, I just think what she does is uncanny. I mean, she drops into these voices that are just like these, these completely vivid, pitch perfect impressions of people in her life. And it's, it's, it's uncanny. And so I, I would say those three. That's a great question, by the way. I've never gotten that question. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to have to dig in. So I know Hedberg. I know Maria Banford. I haven't explored Doug Stanhope. Is there any particular? No, work, there's. Work? A, I think there's one called No Refunds that's on Netflix. <laughs> and it is, I mean, because all of his stuff is meant to make people leave. <laughs> 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 so like all of all the names of his albums are things that imply that you you can't get your money back essentially. <laughs> so does 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 that mean that he does what uh as I understand it, I mean I've listened to and watched a fair amount of his stuff, but Bill Burr. So it seems that Bill Burr will deliberately lose the audiences because it's no longer a challenge to simply make them laugh. He wants to be able to reel them back in. Is that effectively what Doug does? It's yeah, it's it's precisely that. I mean, seeing Doug Stanhope live is it's it's Bill Burr actually to to the extreme. I mean, to the point where I I can't. It's like watching. It's like magic trick. I mean, it's like watching Andy Kaufman doing his bit where he he does like his like Latka character speaking like gibberish to the audience and like bombing and people not realizing it's a character and then going into you know, a perfect Elvis, a pitch perfect Elvis impersonation having it's like, you know, and people go crazy. It, it's, it's, it's this thing where you can't believe that he lands the show after how terrible he's <laughs> made it. And, and it's, it's fascinating. And Bill Burr's, a, yeah, Bill Burr's incredible too. I mean, the, and yeah, Bill Burr would maybe be very close to that list as well. Yeah. Maria is, uh, I've, I've listened to a lot of her comedy and I, <laughs> Being, I suppose, although I, I I alternatively love and hate this description in the self help business, mm -hmm. uh, which I I try sort of not to think about much, but the I get asked about the secret a lot and mm -hmm. manifesting mm -hmm. things, which is not really a focus of mine at all. Sure. But Maria has this hilarious bit that I always mention. I'm like, you should listen to Maria Bamford. Like she talks about the secret, and oh there's this God. bit where she she's talking about being down and out and her sister is very successful sort of corporate yes. super efficient and maria has her over at one point and maria has put together a vision board which is like a yes. board <laughs> yes. and, and there's a microwave on the board and her sister goes a microwave really you want a fucking microwave that's depressing i'll buy you a microwave and the maria is like <laughs> bam manifest <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh my god so genius uh what what purchase comes to mind uh could be recent but whatever that has positively impacted your life uh ideally not like a maserati but something that's i think on the on the less expensive side i would say, this is so this sounds so stupid and like current and speaking of things not enduring who knows what this will even be but my i i find the fitbit was helpful for me mm -hmm. <laughs> because it tracks my sleep and so it it tells me this thing about my sleep which it tells I had you how sleep. much you were walking the night before <laughs> no it's true it's true i mean it tells me it not only tell i don't know if you know about this it not only tells you um you know how you you know what how long you slept but it tells you the quality of sleep mm -hmm. during you know, in other words, like it, it tells you, you know, you slept technically for eight hours, but you, you know, you were awake for an hour of that. So it, it's actually quite helpful. I like it. So you use it primarily for your sleep then? 
I, for my sleep, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I like the steps thing. I like trying to get to 10,000 steps a day. That's helpful. But for the sleep, I mean, because you got to remember, like, I, I've, I've slept over at hospitals, you know, countless times for sleep studies because I have REM behavior disorder. And it's like $3,000 per visit to, I mean, obviously, you know, some of it's insurance, but some of it I have to pay. And it, it, I mean, this thing basically does a sleep study and it costs a hundred bucks. What, uh, what, what type of nighttime rituals do you have? I mean, you mentioned easing in instead of crashing into the wall. Yeah. Uh, do you, do you have any particular kind of wind down or evening rituals? I try to do there. <laughs> there's a, actually a good podcast called, uh, not to be mistaken with sleepwalk with me. There's a good podcast called sleep with me. <laughs> um, I could go a lot of directions. Okay. Yes. And it's this guy named, I think he, he calls himself scooter and he <laughs> sounds trustworthy. And he, and he, uh, he has like this really uncanny skill of talking in circles and slow and a, circling back to the first topic and then the next topic and then another thing and then a digression and the next thing you know you're asleep i mean it's it's pretty fascinating what he does um i'll have to try and that then, um yeah so that that's worth that's worth looking into and then um and then i try to write in my journal and then I, honestly the biggest thing is, is 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 getting off of social media it's you know getting getting off of Twitter and Facebook. I think, you know, in relationship to what we were talking about earlier of like, I was saying the thing about Oliver Stone that he, he joined the army and became, that's how he became self-reliant and how ultimately like everything in your life that you do leads to who you are and what you're able to accomplish. Um, I think that social media is weirdly the exception to that. I think that social media is like this weird kind of looking in the mirror all the time um, thing that is, it's, it's not helpful for, for being productive or, or, or learning. I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if that's true, but that, that's been my feeling lately. I think the, the dose makes the poison. Certainly. I mean, I think yes. there's, there's a point where you're like, Oh, this Tylenol is helping my headache. And then, Oh, I, my stomach lining just fell out of my ass. Or, <laughs> and, that's extreme. <laughs> <laughs> and I think has that I, ever happened? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that that hasn't actually literally happened to me, but there's <laughs> there's definitely a, a point where you know things in excess become their opposite. Uh, what is the on the flip side, uh, the first kind of sixty to one hundred and twenty minutes of your day look like? I mean, are there any particular rituals that you have in the morning? It's a little bit like memento every day. Um, Inject, like, injecting your wife with insulin over and over again. <laughs> it's just like a lot of times if I'm not focused, um, I will kind of wander and, and, you know, it's all until I have coffee, forget about it. I'm a heavy, heavy coffee drinker. And, um, and if I'm on a pro basically if I'm on a project, if I'm shooting a movie, I have a, a complete and exact plan for the next day. And if I'm writing a movie, like I said, and I, I look, put notes next to my bed. You, Mike, wake up. Go, go to the coffee shop and write. Um, I think that when I don't have a routine, I'm a mess and I'm not productive and it's not it's not helpful. Um, so that so that's what I'd say. It's it's inconsistent. And the other thing is I travel. I mean, what, with the thank God for jokes show, I toured a hundred cities in wow. a year, and so it's it's very hard to have rituals when you're going to a hundred cities in a year. Yeah. I wonder if it makes the value of the rituals even greater. If you are able to maintain some semblance of routine when touring, yeah. I don't know. I've never done that. Do you have, do you have a favorite venue in the entire United States? Do you had to pick one? Oh gosh, there's so many. I mean, the upper citizens brigade theater in New York city, it feels like home because I've been on that stage a lot. And the comedy cellar in New York feels similarly. Um, I think that in terms of like a pound for pound venue, I think the Chicago theater is probably your best concert venue in America. Mm. Chicago theater seats about 3000 people. And yet as a performer, you feel like you're talking to people in your living room. 
And as an audience member, it feels like you're just, you know, you're just, you're just watching, you know, someone not in your living room, but sort of, you know, in, it feels intimate. So you are, you're a collector of good advice. What is the worst advice that you hear or see being given out often? And that could be in any domain. Could be comedy, could be writing, could be movies, could be completely unrelated, anything. Uh, it's all about, <laughs> it, you know, it's all about getting your dream, pursuing your dream. Like, I feel like there's something, I, I don't know what the exact advice is that drives me crazy, but I think that there's a cultural thing right now that it, it is kind of irksome, which is that, that people feel like they're like, I, I read it recently in the New York times where someone said, um, I'm forgetting her name who wrote this, but she said, if I had advice for college students, it would be, don't ask, what do I want to be when I grow up? Ask, how can I help or how can I change the world or how can I make be of service to other people? And I think that the, the, the kind of like, just kind of be whatever you want to be is is perhaps to be reconsidered by how can I be of service when I'm on the earth for such a short amount of time? Because when, you know, when I do my shows, like it's when, when, when I do my one man shows, for example, Seth Barish and I, we were always talking about what, how is this, how is this story that I'm telling, you know, about, let's say sleepwalk with me. It's a story about, um, it's a story about how I jumped out a second story window while sleepwalking and nearly killed me. I, I was, you know, I, I, I got cut up. I ended up in the, an emergency room. I was, the, the, I, I jumped through a window in the glass, missed my femoral artery by, you know, a centimeter. And, and, and ultimately we had to figure out not how is this show, how is this story about me, but how is it about the audience? And the way that it, we, we discovered it was about the audience is that the that it, it's a it, you know that it's about it's about the catharsis you can experience by sharing something that you're very embarrassed about. In my case, having this life threatening sleep disorder that I was embarrassed about, I thought people would think I'm crazy. It's about the catharsis of opening up and telling people that, and how that can make us feel closer to one another. And so, in that sense, this is a roundabout way of saying. I'm always trying to think about how does, how can my, how can what I'm doing um, be helpful to the audience? How can they go away feeling empowered in their life as opposed to, oh, that was funny, you know, because, because walking away going, oh, that was funny. It's, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's, it, I, it, there's something about it that feels like th th it's a missed opportunity. Well, I, I remember speaking to John Favreau on the podcast about writing and his writing and humor. And he said, I don't, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I don't aim for funny. I aim for truth. And then yeah. the funny you know, often comes along with it. I think that's absolutely true. There's a, there's a, uh, so on this point, sort of what you can offer of service. So, uh, Brian Koppelman mentioned something, uh, in our text exchange, which was, he, meaning you, chooses to be kind. It's a conscious part of who he, he is. And I'm always interested in how he consistently thinks of other people in whatever engagement and how going through life that way makes him feel. Can you confirm or deny or elaborate on that? Because it's, it's uh, I mean, it's, I, I think, a, an observation worth exploring. I mean, is that, a, if that is a decision you make, has it always been the case? Is it something that you came to a particular way? I think it, I think that's from my mother. Um, my mother is a very generous person. She's a you know, she's a nurse for her whole career, and then she was a school nurse for a while, um, elementary school. She's uh, she's very Catholic, um, which is not something that I've followed in her footsteps with. But uh, she's yes, yeah, she's just very sweet to everyone, and so I I try to be. I mean, I don't know if it's true. Um, it's nice to hear that someone says that I, about me, but I'm, I, I, I try, yeah, I try to be nice to, to everyone I meet. I think it's, it's the right thing to do. I think that, you know, I think that peace, you know, on earth is, 
achieved in a micro sense. I think it, it's peace is achieved through every person who you meet in your day is, is that an opportunity, it's an opportunity to contribute to peace, uh, everywhere. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, I, maybe that's, it's naive, but but I that's how that's how that's how I think of it. I don't think it's naive. I mean, I think the the macro is made up of the micro, right? And yeah. And that I remember this story I heard. I believe it was from a professor at Stanford named B.J. Fogg, who decided to teach a class, as professors at Stanford are allowed to do, that he effectively made up out of thin air. And I think it was creating world peace or something like that. Had no idea what the yeah. syllabus or the curriculum would be whatsoever. And then 30 students show up and he tries to figure out what the class is. And what he realized very quickly is that you had students from, say, Israel, Palestine, all over the place no one could even agree on what world peace meant. Like, what does world mm, peace look like? Yeah, so he said, okay, sure. since we can't agree on world peace, though, and this was the interesting part, he said, let us try to agree on what the antecedents to world oh, peace would be. Like, that's smart. what are the constituent parts that might make up world peace? Let's start to agree on some of the in ingredients. Mm -hmm. And then he had them work on projects focused on those common ingredients. So it's like, I, I, and I do feel like to take something like peace and make it actionable by necessity, you're going to bring it down to the micro. Otherwise, it's just not actionable. It's too abstract. Yeah. I hope, that, by the way, I, I, I'm fearing as I'm saying this, like that someone's listening to this going, well, I met Mike Birbiglia and he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so like it's, the worst. it's also the, the I have that with Q and A's like a lot of times with touring with Don't Think Twice, people that will do Q and A's and I'll be like twenty minutes into it and it'll it'll hit me like a ton of bricks like what if the people in the audience didn't like the movie now they're listening to someone babble on about how they made the thing that they don't even like. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I, can you imagine a worse fate than listening to someone talk about a thing that they, that you don't even like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I have to say, and this is not going to get a lot of sympathy from most people listening to this, but I have a lot more empathy for people in the public light than I did, say, 10 years ago. Because sure, you see, like you, <laughs> like, you wonder, like, I wonder if that guy thinks I'm a total dick, but it just so sure. happens like your cat got run over by a car and like your kid pissed on your trousers before you had to go to an important meeting and then your wife called and was really upset and then some guy dropped your coffee on the floor and you're just <sighs> in a shitty mood and that person yeah. happens to come up to you like as you're running to the gate to catch a flight that you're going to miss and yeah. they have a 30 second exposure to you in a really rare off moment and they're like wow that guy is an asshole and like or you literally just or you literally just sprain your wrist like grabbing for a suitcase i had that happen on this last trip yeah yeah and it's just like and then someone someone comes up to you right at that moment and is like hey i'm a big fan and i'm like ah uh, i'm I, i'm this is a really strange thing to say i'm in a lot of pain right now you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're like yeah i met that guy he made up the most ridiculous story <laughs> <laughs> he blamed it on his wrist yeah and uh, i uh i mean and it's it's i mean i had this experience yesterday uh which was hilarious and infuriating at the same time this is yet another reason to stay off of social media and i saw this guy who's I suppose you would call him a journalist or a, a sort of a media producer who's who'd been pinging me via text message for a while i'd been traveling out of the country this and that to like get together have drinks and like hey buddy how's it going all this and i guess i didn't reply to them and so his tweet was you know tim ferris is like an arrogant self-centered ass but it doesn't mean you can't learn lessons from him and i was like oh so this is what happens when i am out of the country for two months and miss someone's uh, text like they assume uh, they assume malice so the, i remember a piece of advice i was given or, or read at some point i mixed those up was you know never never attribute and i've modified it a bit but like never attribute to malice what you can attribute to incompetence now the way i've modified that is never attribute to malice what you can attribute to incompetence or busyness oh right? busyness yeah right it's yeah. just like you don't know what battle someone else is fighting like they might come off as a dick and it's like i'm not going to give away too much in the movie but it's like something catastrophic could have happened that they're not being open about because they don't want to be open about it and yes. uh, you know just assume that it's not a personal attack uh but i'm getting up on a soapbox let me chill myself out uh i think that's well, that's good advice
Uh, what is the best meat you've done? You said a hundred, hundred cities, right? Is there, yeah. is, do you have a favorite meal that comes to mind and maybe it's pizza could be, mm-hmm. but is there, yeah. is there a favorite meal or drink of yours that comes to mind? I think that some, some combination of like, gr- I love great macaroni and cheese. Like I, like, like I, like I love going to like the fanciest restaurant you can imagine and just ordering macaroni and cheese or like ordering the hamburger. Like or, I always, <laughs> I always find that like, like if you go to some place that's some, you know, 50 bucks a plate or something like that, like sure you can order the chicken or the steak or whatever, but man, can they make a hamburger? <laughs> Now, are you deliberately? Is that at for your joy, or is it to like, uh, no, I'm like not remotely to, flog I'm not the kitchen? Flank, no, I'm not trying to flank the system. It, I think so. You're not like, asking for like super well done because I know that makes chefs completely insane. No, no, no. I think it's a cuisine loophole. I think that it's. I think it's. A, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great secret in cuisine, which is that you to order the kind of inexpensive pedestrian item on a really expensive fancy menu is more often than not amazing like to go to a town to go to a fancy restaurant if you like if you're in a fancy restaurant and for whatever reason like there's peanut butter and jelly on the menu order the peanut butter and jelly because those people aren't fucking around (laughs) (laughs) oh god i love it no that's good advice i remember i i had two different pieces of advice from two very good chefs. So one said, if you go out to a restaurant, never have the roast chicken because you can always make roast yes. chicken at home. I think that's smart. Like you can always make it at home. But I had someone else say, if you can get roast chicken on the menu at a fancy restaurant, get the roast chicken oh, because yeah. everyone can make it at home. You think you know roast chicken. Oh, yeah. So maybe along the lines of the PB&J. So if, if you... <laughs> maybe it's order the PB&J if you could have one billboard anywhere with anything on it what would it say it would say I put it like in Times Square and it would say none of these companies care about you Ooh, I like it because it's because I think that that's that, that's one of the things that I feel like I've learned over the years which is like that that we've we've come to trust corporations in a certain sense and we we forget the fact that they actually have no vested interest in us other than our money mm. um which is you know and it, which which harkens back to the thing i was saying about gatekeepers which is like you know people always say to me like hey <laughs> i have i have a, a very much of a niche career i have a career where if people know my work more often than not they're like oh that's that's great i'm a huge fan this is great what you do and but most people don't know who I am. It's it's the the, the definition of niche. You know, um, I don't get stopped on the street almost ever, which is great. It's phenomenal. Um, and so and and so in relation to that is I, I do things that are self produced. You know, I'm a producer on my movies. I'm a producer on my one man shows. I produce my tours. It's all in house, and I try not to to kind of bow to the gatekeepers of show business because. I, they don't care about me. I mean, they really don't like they, they, the, the, the networks and the studios, all they care about is whether or not my movie or my TV show or whatever it would be would make them money. But, but so why would I try to, why would I try to please those people? I, the people I'm trying to please is my audience. They're the people who, who buy my albums or buy, you know, who go buy tick by movie tickets. Those are the people I care about. Those are the people I'm making the movies for. So I would say, so my billboard is these, these companies don't care about you. (laughs) Do you have any other rules, uh, that you've developed for the, I was going to say the business side of the art that you're involved with. Uh, but just in terms of managing your life and career. Are there any other rules you've set for yourself that have helped you to have the success and longevity that you've had? I think if I, I think my advice is just to, to try to figure out what what the what they do well in this kind of the system, the studio system, the, the network system, and just pull it out and replicate the parts that you think work 
and and then do the rest yourself. So so like in other words, I when my first off Broadway show was Sleepwalk with Me, and it was very much like by the book, and it was you, you know like it was it was produced in this way that you know it was the off Broadway like system, like it was you know it had a you know a general manager, general management company that took such and such a fee, and it had you know this many people who are on the payroll and all this kind of stuff. And my agent and I, after the fact, because the, the, the show, even though it was like this big success and it ran for eight months, the show technically, this is a very common thing in Hollywood. It's like, um, it lost money technically. Right. Like it wasn't like the, the, I guess the most famous story of this is the Simpsons, like the Simpsons franchise. I don't know if this is true still, but like for a few years ago, it was, it was like, it was not in profit. Have you ever heard that story? <laughs> oh, I haven't heard the story of The Simpsons, but I've read some some articles on Hollywood accounting and <laughs> so Hollywood accounting is crazy. It's, it's bananas. completely bonkers. I mean, it's 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 on par with like, wait, I'm making this up. I don't know if this is accurate, so don't <laughs> don't sue me, GM. But when people are like, oh yeah, GM paid no taxes last year, or like, you know, Apple yeah. paid no taxes last year, and you're like, what? And uh, it's it's absolutely on par. You're like, oh, the movie grossed a billion dollars, but no one saw any back end participation mysteriously for these various reasons that are detailed in this article. But no, I haven't heard the Simpsons example. But yeah, so yeah, and so and so and so like you know, a, another example is like my my last movie, Sleepwalk with Me. I, I won't sort of name the names involved, but like it didn't it didn't techni- it didn't technically make money, even though it did like two and a quarter at the box office, which is a lot for a small film that was made for a million dollars. And then it did, you know, probably a million, whatever, maybe more digitally on Netflix and iTunes and all these things. And so it may, it quote unquote made like three, somewhere between three to $5 million. We made it for a million dollars budget, which is like nothing in the world of independent film. Yeah. Super budget. And the the movie didn't make money (laughs) and it doesn't, I mean, I'm trying not to curse. It doesn't fucking make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. And so this time around, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to cut out all the people who charged the movie, so to speak, and ha- be- became like a line item in the budget for the marketing and the distribution of the movie. And I'm just going to do it myself. So like, Don't Think Twice is essentially self-distributed in cooperation with this company, the Film Arcade, which is like a small distribution company that I basically told my story to. And we're like, well, let's build this from scratch. I'll go from town to town. I'll go to 30 cities um, and I'll hand deliver this movie. And so like this summer, my my whole summer has been me going town to town, showing sneak previews of the movie and then doing a free improv workshop for uh, improv theaters in that town. So we're going to IO in Chicago and UCB in New York and the Torch Theater in Phoenix and the, you know, all of the Planet Ant Theater in, uh, in Detroit, which is where Keegan Michael Key started. And we're doing these free workshops just as a, like an act of goodwill. Because basically we, we thought like, well, why don't we, instead of like buying a ton of TV ads and this and that, all the traditional marketing, why don't we spend that money just, just having me be a walking billboard for the movie and go town to town and and spread goodwill. Say, hey, we're gonna do free improv workshops. We're gonna do we're gonna give out free tickets to local improv theaters and and we're gonna do Q and A's. And I so anyway, so to get back to what you're saying in a business sense, I would say steal the ideas that corporations use that work and then fill in the rest yourself. Yeah. Steal the thunder from the gods. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she doesn't actually belong to them anyway. In a lot of senses. <laughs> I'm really excited about uh, that. I'm I'm continually excited about this type of experiment, and particularly given my experience with the podcast, which after many many years is really the first, in a sense, aside from the blog and so on, the first free agent enterprise that I've had complete unilateral creative control over. Yeah. And it's it's, the democratization of podcasts has been incredible for radio. Oh, it's so it's just such a boon and such a joy. And for that reason, I mean, I'm going to be experimenting with a lot of different approaches with uh, publishing as it relates to books and otherwise. 
because every time I have in the past let someone pay for something, which is usually bloated in, yeah. some, in some capacity, yeah, as you absolutely. mentioned. Yep. You, well, the publish, you, whole publishing industry is bloated. Yeah, you, you, will not, you will not have the control of the protections that you would want uh, as, as a doer. So how can people see the film? And of course, it's kind of contingent, I suppose, upon when people are hearing this. But what yes. would you, how would you like people to check it out? And I, I have really been enjoying it. Uh, Chris Saka loved it. I've heard uh, great things uh, from a number of different people, and I certainly recommend people check it out. But where can they where can they learn more and see more? They can. There's there's a site called Don't Think uh, Don't Think Twice Movie dot com uh, at uh, the Twitter handle at Don't Think. My my Twitter handle is at Burbigs B I R B I G S, um, and you can see that like go, you know I'm traveling around the country to like 30 cities. It's gonna, with people's help, don't think twice, we'll get into, you know, three to 500, you know, theaters across the country and, and maybe more. And it's, and it, but it's entirely contingent on the people listening uh, to this. Like we, like, and, and I, I would just, I, I'm at Nantucket Film Festival right now and there's great movies. There's this documentary called Tickle that's phenomenal. Um, there's uh, this movie called, uh, other people that uh, Chris Kelly made. There's the Captain Fantastic, which I was telling you about. Um, there's a Norman Lear documentary. There's so many great independent films. And what I urge people to do is go to the theaters, go to your local cinema and see small films that, you know, read a few reviews and you know, go to the ones that you think might work for you. But um, it really does help for for there to be more of them like no one's getting rich on independent film but if but if the movie makes a few million dollars i'll get to make another movie and i'll put my heart and soul into it and so that's that's what i would ask and the the just for people who are wondering i mean i obviously i shouldn't say obviously but i'll say those people who've been listening to me or following me long enough know this that i i take endorsing things very very seriously i don't it's very easy to destroy a reputation that takes a long time to build and i feel sure. very comfortable recommending this movie it's uh uh when i was watching it earlier with cal at one point a few minutes into it he said wait a second is this documentary or script <laughs> and yeah. and th i mean that is just about the highest compliment as it relates to acting that appears completely natural and I, I thought to myself, wow, like that is a very rare comment. And this is coming from someone who's had a lot of immersion in the arts and entertainment also. That's so, a huge compliment. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so everybody definitely check it out. And I will put all of the links in the show notes as usual at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash podcast. One last question, sure. uh, actually two last questions. This one is, what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've ever made? That could be time, money, energy, and just as an example to buy a little bit of time. So Amelia Boone, who's been on the podcast, the, she's won the world's toughest mutter three times and is the most successful female obstacle course racer in the world. Uh, her answer was, to me, paying her first $450 entrance fee, which was a stretch at the time for a world's toughest mutter. So it seemed wow. like a huge stretch, but it completely set her on... Uh, pun intended, this course in her life. I mean, she's also a power attorney at Apple and is just a, a complete machine. But um, what would you what would you offer as your answer to that? I would say spend 15 bucks on a yoga class. <laughs> 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 I started doing yoga two years ago and I, I think that I, if I hadn't started, I, I feel like my body would have broken down completely and I'd be you know, in a sling. Like I, I feel in my wife, my wife, my wife convinced convince me to do yoga after years of telling me that I should do yoga. Um, which is, um, you know, it's hilarious if you, people don't have the visual picture of me, but like the, or they might, but you know, you wouldn't think of me as someone who does yoga and I certainly don't do it well, but, but it is, uh, if you can find a good place for beginners, oh my God, it's, I find it to be completely uh, help. It's very helpful for being productive and being healthy. 
And you are, I think people are as old as their joints feel. So if you sit down a lot, <laughs> it is good to stretch. And uh, I've been doing a lot of acro yoga for the last two years. And I've, I've, my hips and back have never felt better. Oh, that's great. The, uh, so I would encourage people to also, if, if, if for whatever reason you can't manage to get tickets to stand-up comedy by... Uh, Mr. Burbiggs, if you see him in line for a yoga class and want to get some indirect comedy by watching his <laughs> yes. downward dog and cobra poses, <laughs> then uh, that is that is much like the, the culinary loophole we talked about earlier. I'll, I'll tell you, this is going to sound like I'm kissing up, but my wife urged me to wedge this in somehow, which is the if the people just listen to the podcast and they don't have your book, uh, get your uh, work for our work week. Your, I believe your first book. That's um, the first book, which is, mm-hmm. which is how I was introduced to it. Your work is um, it, because I I have a completely different outlook on vacation now. Um, mm. The way that you talk about how the like essentially we're working these eight eighty hour weeks, let's say, for this pie in the sky idea of retirement at the end of our lives that God knows what the hell that even is anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and live, that, live that retirement in fits and spurts in the middle of your life so you understand the perspective of what that even is. And because of that, my wife and I took a vacation to Laguna Beach where I shut off my computer for five days at the beginning of June. And it's literally because of your book. Well, thank you for sharing that. That makes, uh, that makes, my, makes my day. And uh, Laguna Beach is a great choice. That's a beautiful spot. <laughs> it was, I looked. I, ser- I searched all over it. That's yeah. That's uh, I'm I'm a, I'm an amateur travel agent. <laughs> yeah. The uh, for those people who haven't read the book, yeah. The, the the balloon payment at the end for the deferred life plan is far from guaranteed. Uh, far from guaranteed. Far yeah. from guaranteed. So it's it's good to good to break up the work with many retirements for sure. Is there any ask or request uh, as we wrap up? Um, any any parting comments or asks or requests for my audience? No, just that you know, follow you know, follow the movie on uh, don't think at don't think movie on Twitter or follow me at for Biggs on Twitter and and so and if you you know, tr- like trust me that the movie's really good and I I think you'll laugh and I think you might cry, which is which for you know take someone on a date take take a few of your friends and. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it, there's a lot of love that went into making something that a lot of people so far have liked. And so, yeah, it would just mean a lot to me. Yeah. And it also, and it also supports an ecosystem of creators creating, uh, which, so. which, uh, I'm extremely passionate about and I think pretty well informed regarding, and I would just tell people, you know, every time. I have to or choose to review something, whether it's a book or a movie or anything else, um, right before an interview, I'm always nervous. And I'm just like, oh God, like, am I going to have to tap dance around the fact that I didn't like something by yeah, like uh, the, the glaring omission of mentioning it or anything like that? And within five minutes of putting this on, I was like, oh, thank fucking God. Okay. I don't have to, <laughs> I yeah. don't have to, I don't have to deal with any of that. It was such a wash of relief. Um, so I, I do encourage people to check it out and Mike, I know you got a lot going on right now. You are, you are juggling the, all of the activities that go with taking matters into your own hands with a creative (laughs) endeavor like this. Uh, and so I, I, uh, certainly send good vibes to you for the endurance, the endurance and courage and strength that you will need on the road. Uh, and, uh, this is great fun. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks. And, and as a disclaimer to anybody who's listening to this and going like, but I don't even like Mike Birbiglia's comedy. Why am I listening to him talk about it? Just know on a lot of days, I don't like it either. <laughs> 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 so, so I might be wrong about everything I've just said, but I'm just trying my best like anybody else. it's all we can ask man everybody's just trying to get by one day at a time uh mike well best best of luck with everything and uh to everyone listening as always i'll mention it again you can find links to everything including the movie including social including books and dvds and so on that came up in the show notes 
as well as those notes for every other episode at fourhourworkweek.com forward slash podcast. And until next time, and as always, thank you for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out. And just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront, and this is a very unique sponsor. Wealthfront is a massively disruptive, in a good way, set it and forget it investing service led by technologists from places like Apple and world famous investors. It has exploded in popularity in the last two years, and they now have more than two and a half billion dollars under management. In fact, some of my very good friends, investors in Silicon Valley have millions of their own money in Wealthfront. So the question is why? Why is it so popular? Why is it unique? Because you can get services previously reserved for the ultra wealthy, but only pay pennies on the dollar for them. And this is because they use smarter software instead of retail locations, bloated sales teams, et cetera. And I'll come back to that in a second. I suggest you check out wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. Take the risk assessment quiz, which only takes two to five minutes, and they'll show you for free exactly the portfolio they'd put you in. And if you just want to take their advice, run with it, do it yourself, you can do that. Or as I would, you can set it and forget it. And here's why. The value of Wealthfront is in the automation of habits and strategies that investors should be using on a regular basis, but normally aren't. Great investing is a marathon, not a sprint, and little things that you may or may not be familiar with, like automatic tax loss harvesting, rebalancing your portfolio across more than 10 asset classes, and dividend reinvestment add up to very large amounts of money over longer periods of time. Wealthfront, as I mentioned, since it's using software instead of retail locations, etc., can offer all of this at low costs that were previously Obviously, completely impossible. Right off the bat, you never pay commissions or account fees. For everything, they charge 0.25% per year on assets above the first 15,000, which is managed for free if you use my link, wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. That is less than $5 a month to invest a $30,000 account, for instance. Now, normally, when I have a sponsor on this show, it's because I use them and recommend them. In this case, it's a little different. I don't use Wealthfront yet because I'm not allowed to. Here's the deal. They wanted to sponsor this podcast, but because of SEC regulations, companies that invest your money are not allowed to use client testimonials. So I couldn't be a user and have them on the podcast. But I've been so impressed by Wealthfront that I've invested a significant amount of my own money, at least for me, uh, in the team and the company itself. So I am an investor and hope to soon use it as a client. Now back to the recommendation. As a Tim Ferriss Show listener, you'll get $15,000 managed for free if you decide to open an account, but just start with seeing the portfolio that they would suggest for you. Take two minutes, fill out their questionnaire at wealthfront.com forward slash Tim. It's fast, it's free. There's no downside that I can think of. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. I reached out to these Finnish entrepreneurs after a very talented acrobat introduced me to one of their products, which blew my mind in the best way possible. It is mushroom coffee. What on earth is this? Well, it includes chaga mushroom, very powerful antioxidant, considered a superfood. I was introduced to chaga by Laird Hamilton, the king of big wave surfing of all things. And it includes another mushroom that is considered a nootropic, a smart drug, and this is lion's mane. In the entire packet, you just add it to hot water, it tastes like coffee. There is only 40 milligrams of caffeine, so less than half what you would find in a cup of coffee. So I do not get any jitters, I do not get any acid reflux or any type of stomach burn. And it put me on fire for an entire day and I only had half of the packet. So this stuff is really amazing. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement. Right now, this is the answer. So it is legal, it will not give you visuals, that's something else. And you can try it right now, 
by going to foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. That is four sigmatic, S I G M A T I C, foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim, and use the code Tim to get 20% off your first order. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. foursigmatic.com forward slash Tim. 